All right. What do you uh what do you think of this recovery stuff, man? What do y'all think? God's doing some good stuff, huh? Um so I, I just a question for you. How many of y'all um how many of you guys have like a long commute? You, people, any any of you in a car for a long period of time? Anybody in a car? Like one, two, two of you. Okay. More than like ten minutes, fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. What do y'all listen to when you're in the car? What do you listen to? Oh my gosh. <laughs> she said Christmas music. <laughs> Tisha, in in July, she's listening to Christmas music. Who, what else do y'all listen? What do you do when you're in the car, huh? Listen to my children cry. They're in their 20s? How old are, no. What else do you do in the car? Worship. There's a godly woman. Anybody podcast person? Podcast folks? Yeah. Huh? Dead Inside Pocket, a little plug for T.J. Wallace's podcast is a good one, yeah. Anybody listen to uh, the devil's music? Anybody listen to that terrible stuff? Rock and roll? Oh, she does. All right, hey. <laughs> Some of y'all listen to that rock and roll music, country. Actually, the devil's music is country music. Jesus, name. Any of you country music fans out there? Oh, my God, sorry. Huh? So I, I, one of my very favorite places to be in the whole world is inside of my vehicle. Anybody feel that way? It's just, it's quiet. I like to just get in the car and just go. It's a place that I usually can kind of be on my own. I can kind of relax. I don't have to deal with folks. I can just put on a podcast or I listen to an audio book or something like that. And uh, if, uh, if even in traveling, I've, I've kind of, travel around the country with different ministries and stuff like that and and i'd way rather drive in a car than fly in a plane can i get a witness uh 10 12 hours man i'd just way rather just get me in the car and just go 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 and uh so i i don't i, I we're um, let me get to our step we're in the power of surrender check this out the power of surrender step three we decided to turn our will and our lives over to the care of god maybe step three here comes a step. Ready, go. Ready. There it is. Made us to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. Romans 10, 13. Will you all read this with me? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13. Our core question, what is currently keeping you from surrendering your life and will completely to Jesus as Savior and Lord? That is our core question. What is currently keeping you from surrendering your life and will completely over to Jesus as both Savior and Lord. I want you to be thinking about this question throughout this whole conversation that we're going to be having. And, um, you know, I have tried to find throughout my life just opportunities to do this thing called meditation. We talk about meditation in the Recovery Live Handbook. In uh, mental health, uh, they've come up with this fancy new term called mindfulness. Has anybody ever heard of mindfulness? Maybe you practice mindfulness, but meditation is really the root of mindfulness, and it's been around for a very long time. And these are opportunities when I get a chance to meditate on the Word or meditate on nature, meditate just on something God is trying to speak to me, that I'll do that in those quiet times <clears throat> in the car. And it's really... Those are just sweet, sweet opportunities for me, whether I'm, I'm just driving to church or going up, you know, just drove my daughter up to, uh, to the airport to, to ha see her off and just had some time in the car and just some time to, to meditate. And, and how many of you know surrender is not a one-time decision? It's a what? It's a lifestyle. Surrender is a lifestyle. And these are just opportunities, again, to just go, God, just take over, especially when I'm driving on 70 and 40 you know what i'm saying a lot of surrender is needed in those times anybody has some road rage out there it gets a little scary out there um and so just driving in the car are opportunities for me to just have moments of just surrender and meditation and mindfulness and quiet and i'm going to tell you something kind of weird but me i'm just hoping somebody can connect with me on this one of my favorite things to do while i'm in the car one of the 
just most, I don't know, just a lovely experience is going through the car wash. Does anybody enjoy going through? Right? there. I don't know what it is. It's just the most lovely experience in the world. It's like, it's like Willy Wonka's factory or something. You're just, you got the car, you got your, like, you got your, uh, your podcast on, you, you pull up, you, you pay $97 for the full wax, double wax, the tires, all of it. And you, they, they, they're going like this, and they go, just let go. Let go of the wheel. Oh, yeah. Take your foot off the gas, right? Put it in neutral. Close your eyes and just let the magic happen, right? You know what I'm saying? Some of you are like, I got to get to the car wash. What car wash are you going to? Yeah. You just get in there and all, there's all these colors, right? All the colors of the different soaps coming and the brushes and people waving at you as you're going by and spray water spraying. And there's something just very satisfying about you know, the, then the dryer hits you, and you're just, you're just, the car's kind of rocking back and forth. It's just this beautiful experience. You guys all think I'm insane. I can see it. <laughs> and the other day, <laughs> so I got a 2011 Tahoe, and it's got almost 300,000 miles on it. Yeah. And I take that truck through there, and, and it's just, it, it comes out of there all pretty blue, sparkling. Tires just nice and glossy black, you know, and it's just a lovely experience. But <clears throat> my wife has a 2018, a little more modern vehicle, and I've never taken her car to the car wash. And I thought I'd be husband of the year and take her car through the car wash because I'm just awesome like that. And I took the car there and I do all the things. I'm listening to the podcast. Guy says, take it, just take your hands right off the wheel. I take my hands off the wheel, put it in neutral. It starts to go through there. And how many of you know what begins to happen? Do you know these cars today? They have all these alarm systems. <laughs> right? If you get close to the bumper on this side, stuff starts, bells and alarms, beep, 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 start going off. You know, if a car gets close to you in, on the side or so a pedestrian walks in front of you, what do you think happens when 50 brushes start to hit a car with every alarm system on the planet in the car? It starts to lose its mind, like lose it. And I'm just like trying to push buttons and figure out how do I turn. Stuff's going crazy. The windshield wipers start going off. Things are going nuts. I'm trying every lever I can go. And the thing is going absolutely nuts. It's not quite the same experience. So if you can help me, if you know how to turn these things off, please let me know how to turn these things off. Now, here's the thing I want to share with you. In recovery, we often kind of make that choice to surrender. You all have done this. You've made that decision, that first decision, those first three steps, right? I can't, he can, I think I'll let him, right? That's the first three steps. I've realized I'm powerless. I, I'm, I'm in a position where I've, I've hit bottom. Uh, my, my relationship fell apart. My addiction ran away with me. Um, about, I'm about to, you know, financially crash, have to declare bankruptcy. Something happens where you go, all right, I've got to find a different solution because what I'm doing isn't working. Any, have you been there before? I, I, what I was trying to do hasn't been working. And so that's step one is I'm powerless. My life's unmanageable. The second step is like maybe there's a power greater than myself that I can hook my arm around that that life preserver, and, and maybe there's something that can haul me out of my, my mess, right? That's step two. There's a power greater than myself who can restore me, maybe. And so step three is that surrender step, and I'm going to turn my life and will over to God. I'm going to do this thing called, called surrender. And we know that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved, and they are saved. And we, we've seen that happen. We've seen God rescue us. I think hopefully most of us in this room We've been in that place where we had that moment of surrender and we have seen God come through. But here's the thing, is 
and, and I realize this more and more with counseling, with the, the work I do in counseling and recovery, is that there's just something about the normalcy of chaos. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, that, that you've lived in chaos so long that when things calm down and you begin to see how surrender has worked in your life, you start to get a little restless. Anybody been there before? Like it just gets to be a little too quiet. Yeah? And, and, and sometimes we get to a situation where we've surrendered, we take our hands off the wheel, we're trying to live that lifestyle of living in surrender. We took our foot off the gas, we let go out of necessity, but then we stay in that place and we keep going through this process of surrender and all of a sudden all the alarms start to go off in our head. Everything starts to feel unsafe. And we do what? We grab the steering wheel again. We put our foot back on the gas. We put that thing in the drive and say, I'm, I'm taking control again. All the alarms are going off, and though we are perfectly safe, and we are perfectly okay, and in fact, we're still being cleaned out, the, we're getting jiggled around a little bit, things are feeling a little chaotic internally, but ultimately we're just as safe as when we first surrendered, we start to have all the alarms going off, and we're going unsafe, unsafe, something is wrong, I got to take control again. You know what I'm saying? Have you been there before? And though all those alarms are going off, I want to talk about how do you stay in surrender? Because recovery is not just about that one-time choice to surrender, but it's staying in surrender through the whole process of God cleaning us out and working on us and getting us to a place where we move from surrender all the way to service, step 12. Because I'm telling you, a lot of people are three steppers they do real good in those first three steps but then step four hits and they're like peace <laughs> this is not what i signed up for something begins to say i'm in danger and i have to take control again and i i have to say i get it when you've lived in chaos when you've had just this instinct that I've got to just take care of myself, I've got to just survive on my own, you've reached this level of independence. Survival, that survival instinct can keep us in a place where surrender is very, very difficult. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but that's kind of what I want to, I want to look at today. And I want to look at a scripture, it's in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. I'm just going to read this to you, and I just we're not going to even put it up there. I just want you to hear this story, and you've heard this story before, and, and you'll hear it again, but I, I want you to just try and focus on it like maybe you've never heard it before. If you can, just do the best you can to focus on this in the light of the question, our core question, what's currently keeping you from surrendering your life, and will completely staying in that place where you're just completely bought in to all that God has for you. I want you to think of that question in light of Matthew 14, 22 through 33. And here's how this story goes. It says, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. And he dismissed the crowd. Jesus made the disciples. How many disciples were there? Twelve. Puts them in a boat. And says, you're going over to the other side, and he is not in the boat with them. Take note of that. Because he dismisses them, and then he goes up on the mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he, they're all by himself, and the boat is a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. The waves are starting to chop up. Jesus is not out there with them. And shortly before dawn, Jesus goes out to them, and he is doing what? Do y'all know what he's doing? Come on. He's walking on the water. Isn't that something else? That's pretty crazy. He's out there walking on the water. The disciples saw him walking on the water, and they're like, hey, it's Jesus. No, what does it say? They're terrified. 
I know this is like a Bible story we heard in Sunday school, and we go, you know, I've heard this story. But just imagine some dudes, like, strolling up to you while you're out fishing on the water. That would freak you out. I hope it would freak you out. It was a little terrifying. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. And Jesus said, take courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. All right, that's a great story all by itself, isn't it? That's quite a, I mean, that's quite an, a, a, an event in history that Jesus sends the 12 out very purposefully, sends them out on, onto uh, uh, the lake, onto the Sea of Galilee. They go out there on this big old body of water. It's pretty choppy, pretty stormy. Seems like they're already a little bit, kind of they're in a little bit of turbulence and here comes jesus out onto the water walking on the water and he says don't be afraid i'm here all right i want you to think about that in terms of your recovery that jesus rescued each one of us from whatever struggle that we were going through and we have become his disciple we've gone through those first three steps and we said yes to jesus we said yes to being rescued we said yes god calm these crazy seas this moment or series of moments where you finally get to that place where you say god i want to just give you my life i don't like the the struggle and the suffering i'm in that's kind of stage one that's steps one through three and then something else happens Something else happens internally inside of us, and Jesus kind of in each one of us, and, I, and I'm, I'm positive this, this is true for every person that's sitting in these seats in this church tonight. Some point in time he says, there's more. Everybody in this room, there's more. There's more than just survival. There's more than just sobriety. There's more than just life can get a little bit better. There's more than just relief. There's more than just stop smoking. Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you and I'm going to rescue you, but there's more. And 11 out of the 12 in that boat said, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? You know where I'm going. 11 out of 12 said, thank you, but I'm good. And that's our frustration, Pastor Rodney, a little bit sometimes, right? I mean, that we know there's more. And we know it's terrifying. But we know what it looks like to get out of the boat. And we want that for you. And we need that for you. Because we can't do it on our own. We need some water walkers. We need some water walkers. And some of you have experienced that in this room. Some of you have experienced that there's more. But John Ortberg, he wrote a book. John Ortberg wrote, wrote a book, and he says, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Here's what happens, and you guys know, I'm, I'm giving away the ending, but I, I know you know this story, is that you got 11 out of the 12 sitting in the boat going, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> wow, Jesus. Good for you. <laughs> right? How about that Jesus? And then Peter goes, Whoa, I want to walk on water. And the other disciples are like, yeah, me too. No, they don't. Not a one of them. Not a one of them. Only Peter. Peter says this. He says, Lord, if it's you, Kind of a, just feeling things out. 
If you're not really a ghost, if it's really you, tell me to come walk out on that water. What a risky thing to ask. And Jesus is like, how dare you ask such a question? Is that what he says? He says, you're not Jesus. Who do you think you are, Peter? Stay in the boat. Let me do the work out here. Let me do the miracles. What does he say? He says, come. He says, come. One word. Come on. Let's go. Come. And what does Peter do? Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and he came towards Jesus. Now, we know the rest of the story, or some of us, you can go back and, and read the rest. I know Peter got a, little, got a little terrified, but he went out. Nobody else is out there. You surrendered. Praise God. You're seeing some miraculous things happening. You're seeing some sobriety. You're seeing your life get a little bit better. You're seeing yourself find some relief. You see your marriage is getting stronger. You're finding some some healing but God is saying you haven't seen anything yet you haven't seen anything yet there's more there's more there's more for you but you got to get out of the boat and John Orberg in his book if you want to walk on water you have to get out of the boat he wrote the decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. This means that to be a follower of Jesus, you must renounce comfort as the ultimate value of your life. The decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. To be a follower of Jesus, you must renounce comfort as the ultimate value of your life. I read a book about a young woman. She talked about how she would run away and sabotage every time she got close to people. She'd sabotage her recovery. She'd sabotage her life. She would just disappear, and she would abandon the people who loved her and were trying to help her. Every time she got a little closer to her healing, a little closer to her calling, she would just take off, gone. It was her survival instinct. People called her flaky. People called her noncommittal. But she was terrified because she didn't want to open herself up fully to people because she was afraid of what they were going to do to her because people had always hurt her and always abandoned her. And so she learned how to survive and take care of herself. And ultimately, the thing she would say is this. There's only one person who cares about me, and it's me. I know I'll take care of myself better than anybody else can. And so when she really finally got around safe and healthy people, she, just, it, she would just lose her mind. Even though she knew something inside of herself said, this is okay, this is healthy, this is safe, those alarms would go off. Even though she was getting cleaned up and getting better and healthier, those alarms would go off and she'd be gone. And ultimately, she finally stuck around and she fully surrendered to love. But what she described, I think, was just absolutely brilliant. Here's what she said. She described her own coping as this. She was self-medicating with survival. Isn't that good? She was self-medicating with survival. That sounds like a lot of people that I work with. She said for her, she lived with chaos so long, both self-induced and inflicted, that she always had warnings going off in her head. Almost everything told her she needed to duck and run. And this is what I felt like the Holy Spirit downloaded as I was, I was reading about this, is sometimes our instincts of survival are the greatest enemy to surrender. That ultimately what we're talking about is comfort. I don't want to 
dismiss and and in and not validate the fact that maybe it's not just like you're you're saying, John, it's not it's not comfort, it's just I'm terrified because bad things have happened when I fully surrender to other people. When I fully engage, I've gotten hurt. And I want to validate that. But I just want you to know that there's no way. There's no way for you to get fully into God's calling and His purpose without taking some risks. That I have been hurt by people, by places, by churches. And so have you. But there's no place I'd rather be than fully in my calling. And I want you to think about tonight going beyond a place of just first level surrender. Though all the warning bells are going off. Though everything tells you that you're good to go right where you're at and, and, and that you don't need to push yourself anymore and that you're finally starting to figure things out and you don't need to, to, to get all risky and, and mess all up the, the comfortable place that you've gotten to, that you wouldn't ignore the voice of God saying, but there's more. There's more. I don't care where you're at. I don't care if this is all brand new to you or you've been doing this forever. Some of you have gotten just too comfortable, and it's time to go a little bit deeper. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask Candy to come up and start spreading out these surrender chips. And here's what we're going to do is, is for sure there's some folks in this room that you have been in a place where you've relapsed with your addiction or You've relapsed with some anger, or, or maybe this is your first time here. Maybe you've been coming for a while, and you, you've been resisting, and tonight could be the night of, of, of you saying yes to Jesus and fully surrendering to him and fully surrendering to this process, and we're going to make that option available to you. But really what I want to do tonight for the rest of you is for you to fully surrender to getting out of the boat and going a little further than you've ever gone before with Jesus because I believe some of you are resisting that full calling that God has called you to. And that you are water walkers, but you've resisted. You've never even maybe even asked the question. You're afraid to ask the question. Every time you just think about the question, all the alarms start going off in your head. God says, I got more. I got more. And all those alarms are going off. And Jesus is saying, it's safe. It's okay. You're going to be fine. I'm going to take care of you. But everything inside of you is like, run. It's, I'm good. I'm going to stay where I'm at. I'm comfortable. Or maybe it's even like you even think about it. You're thinking, man, I, maybe I need to get out of church altogether, man. I don't need to, the pressure of this thing. But God wants more for you. He doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. He wants you to walk in your calling so you can find out what you were created for fully. What would happen? If you just said, God, I'm ready. Can I get out there with you? Because the life of Jesus isn't in that boat. It's outside of it. What's in the boat is what's possible. What's outside of the boat is what's impossible. It doesn't take any faith to get in a boat and just row around. <laughs> it doesn't take faith to do what's possible. It takes faith to do what's impossible. But then it's no longer up to you. And that's terrifying, isn't it? But what God was able to deliver you from, the miraculous deliverance that you've had, that God has worked to save you from yourself and, and save you from your addiction or, or save your marriage, you can be a conduit of that in other people. We can see thousands of people find hope and healing, but we need you to walk in your calling. There's a reason why Peter was the first person at Pentecost to get up and have a conversation with thousands of people, right? There is a reason why Peter was one of the great leaders of the church. There's a reason why Peter was one of those who was closest to Jesus. It's because he was a water walker. He made a bunch of mistakes. He had foot and mouth disease over and over and over again, yes. He was a mess, but he was a risk taker. And he believed in Jesus. 
even in his failure. Will you take a risk tonight? Just ask God, can I get out of the boat? And can I come to you? Would you stand with me? I'm going to sing a song called Surrender. This isn't just for those of you who are struggling with an addiction and you need to surrender. It's not just for those who are struggling with a broken relationship. It's not just for those whose anger is out of control or anxiety or depression. We have surrender chips up here at the altar, and if you're struggling with an addiction, you're struggling with any of those things, I want you to have an opportunity tonight to come and surrender those things to Jesus. The surrender chip on it, it has a date and what you surrendered, and tonight could be the first day of the rest of your life. You could surrender any struggle, any issue you have to Jesus, and he will take it from you. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Maybe there's a secret sin, a secret, a secret struggle, something inside of you. People are, have been telling you that you're so angry. Your, your spouse is saying, man, you're out of control. Whatever it is, God can rescue from it tonight. And you can take that chip and surrender, and your journey can begin tonight. But for some of you, you have halted in your comfort or in your fear or or in your hesitancy, or in your survival mode, to have everything that God wants for you. Because the boat just feels so safe, so comfortable. But what would happen if you stepped out onto the water, and you moved towards Jesus and everything he's got for you? What are you hanging on to? He is no fool who gives up what he can never keep to gain what he can never lose. What if you just said yes to God fully and said, I'm in all the way? If there's something in your life you want to surrender tonight, every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you just need to surrender your life to Jesus for the first time, whatever it is. Or maybe it's your comfort. Maybe it's, it's your survival instincts, whatever it is. Nobody's looking around. You say, man, I want more. I want more tonight. I want more. There's more for me, and I've been holding back. I want more. Nobody is looking around. You'd raise your hand tonight and say, I just want more. I want more. I want more. Raise it high and say, I want more. I want more. If you raise your hand or even if you didn't, I want you to come to this altar. I want you to take a surrender chip. I want you to get on your knees and say, God, I'm ready to get out of the boat. I'm ready to do everything that you want me to do. I'm ready to move towards you. I'm ready to say yes to you. I'm not going to let fear or doubt or, or my survival instincts or my past or my future or my present get in the way of me saying yes fully to you. I want all of it. I'm, I'm going to just ignore these stupid warnings, all, all the bells and all the whistles that are saying, don't do it. And I'm going to just listen to your voice. I'm going to lock eyes with you, and I'm going to say yes to you tonight fully. Now I want you to just come and say, God, give me all. I have a calling on my life, and I'm going to answer it. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if anybody looks at me and says, I can't believe he thinks that he's got a call. I can't believe that she thinks that she can do anything for God. Just ignore it. Ignore the voices. Ignore all of those feelings that say, I can't, I can't. I, forget what people are looking at. Say, man, I don't know if I want to go up to the altar. I've been there a hundred times. Or maybe you've never been there. And you're like, man, it feels undignified. Just get up here and say yes to God. Get on your knees and just watch what he can do with a surrendered life. Just come. Take a surrender chip. As we sing, I surrender. Come on, and let's just pray for each other, and let's give it all to God tonight.